why on earth would you go in and say to somebody you must stop your negative automatic thoughts go and have some homework you know this cognitivism shit now I'm, I'm afraid mm -hmm. sorry for using the word but it is it's utter and complete garbage but you wouldn't go to a doctor in complete health and say doctor i don't have a disease i feel so guilty that i'm not suffering please give yes. me something really unpleasant how does it feel to be so depressed the unconscious will be going like this at you <laughs> That's how it feels to be depressed, you idiot. You're oh. laughing at this protuberance. <laughs> which is <laughs> Should I just turn the camera down a little bit more? That would be better for don't. the audience to see too. <laughs> no, please don't do that. It's tortoise-like. My, 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 my totem animal is a tortoise <laughs> from a dream I had about becoming a psychotherapist. <laughs> I mean, we, we had one. We had a stone one in our consulting room in the NHS, yes, didn't we? we? Did. Yeah. It, it, it turned out it was the philosopher's egg <laughs> on water. That turned into a tortoise and then led me into a field which was a, a wide open consulting room with loads of women waiting to be seen oh mm. yes i was, don't want to see the content <laughs> of your dreams <laughs> it, it, it became my field literally uh, and it was a, dis a disembodied voice as well uh, when i looked at the um what i thought was a rugby ball on on water and uh, the voice said it is an egg and then the egg gave off smoke, or the, the, the rugby ball gave off smoke and ignited. Um, and it was obvious what that was then. And then it turned into a tortoise and crawled out of the water. Mm. And it was a river, um, or a stream really, a substantial stream in its day that was at the bottom of the garden in the house where I lived as a child. Uh, and then it led over the fields uh, to this particularly expansive one, which was a real one. And there was a desk there and a, and a chair waiting. And I sat at the uh, at the desk, and then these women started to appear and sit down, and they were waiting to have therapy. Um, so that kind of uh, gave me an inclination that, that, that I should look at that. Mm. Didn't Anthony Stevens have a dream, not similar to that, but which told him what to do with his life? It was about a three-layered something. There's like a rainbow and something yeah, else underneath I'm it. Not I'm not, not familiar with that one now. Okay, could really. as well. It could have, could have been like um, the structure of his first book or something that was laid out within his dream. Or there, oh, was some, there was something in there that told him where to go with his life. Oh, right, right. Mm -hmm. yeah, they, they, these things happen, don't they? You know, and... Yeah, I mean, later uh, in my life, I actually, I mean, I, I didn't know about the Philosopher's Egg, and then I found a woodcut of it in a book years later, uh, and there it was, um, burning on water, you know, and it was like, wow. Yeah. How old do you reckon that symbol is then? If it's going to be how old? You know, yeah, because if, if you're going to be dreaming about it without having seen it, it must be very, very old. It must, um, and of course, it, it begs the question: where, where does it come from? But also, there is the issue of cryptomnesia, which uh, you know, because we're we're skilled and trained in hypnosis, we know that that is a factor that you would have to rule out in order to say that this is something that just happened, you know, uh, spontaneously. But uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's obviously pretty ancient. Um, I decided to adopt the tortoise as my totem animal for the work that I did on the basis of that. Uh, and I always placed it near the chair. There's a reclining chair where our patients would sit. So if I looked at them, I would see the tortoise. And that would remind me of why I was there, if you see what I mean. Uh, and then on the wall behind where we would sit, we would have pictures of the old masters, you know, all the people who'd inspired us as if they were looking down in judgment and evaluation from behind us. So you, you kind of, in, in my mind anyway, if you like, it was like the whispering in your ear. Mm -hmm. So that pressure behind, the pressure of the sources from the dream in front, uh, all other little things like that. So we, we arranged our room, didn't we, to, to, to make it effective uh, as an environment for us and for the people we were working with. Well, people would often do they were. Yeah, they would, they would. And, you know, it was, it was interesting to be able to guide them through the history of it and the linear progression of the thinking, uh, where it went. And then, of course, we'd have pictures of ourselves with Franz Young up on the wall next to that and uh, the picture of uh, the house at, uh, at Bollingen. Um, sorry, at Kusnak and, and the one at Bollingen as well. So, uh, yeah, we were very mindful of, um, you know, placing ourselves in a tradition which meant that you had to continually live up to the past, yeah. which I think is important, you know. So, yeah. so it simultaneously sort of fulfilled that legacy in yourselves, but also presumably it's for rapport with the patient as well. 
rather than just having oh, a random yeah. room. You, you, you yeah, oh, yeah. It, 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 wasn't, it, wasn't, uh, it wasn't random, was it? We Not had, um, least, no. borrowing from Freud, we, yeah, we had a mantelpiece of all sorts of uh, figures on, you know, which were uh, little bronze casts of mm. Greek and Egyptian gods. The Rosetta Stone was on there. Uh, uh, various other things that meant something. Had a little water feature thing, didn't we? We, we, a little we had, we had a fountain, yeah, had a water fountain going as well because because that was important because it was dynamic and it was energy moving through it in the form of water. Mm. Uh, and we'd have artwork that we'd been given by patients, paintings, they'd be up on yes. the wall. Um, that kind of thing, particularly if uh, the work <clears> with that particular patient had been very, very important for their development and it was part of them moving on and developing that they hand that over because that was acknowledgement, say, to the uh, to the process, wasn't it? Uh, and one of the pictures was uh, that church that you visited. Somebody went and painted that. Yes. Um, it appeared in their dreams. We've got the, the little one, the, the yeah. big one's down at Wayne's, isn't oh, it? Oh, yeah. nice, okay. Uh, at my brother's. Mm, yeah. Yeah, but, but things like that, you know, um, were important. The, the environment's very important, isn't it? It's, in, it's incredibly important. And, and as you're talking, I, I'm thinking about um, counselling rooms very often. Oh, yeah. yeah. A very pet, well, the, the, the complete mm. antithesis, really, of what we try to create. And they're usually very pared back, mm. maybe, you know, grey, white walls. There could be a couch in there and a potted plant. And, you know, and, and, that, and that's, that's the counsellor. <laughs> <laughs> And that's probably about it, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> if you're lucky. Yeah. Um, but I, I just, I feel that's kind of personally kind of impoverished. Yeah. I couldn't work in a place no. like that. No. I found it very difficult. Well, we deliberately did that in the NHS where we, we could, because not all NHS practices would, would allow it, to be honest, no. because we would change the ambience of the room yeah. uh, and of the building effectively by doing that but there was a bit of a shock mm. tactic to it because people would walk in and literally expect to see the equivalent of a doctor's surgery with a couch and the usual stuff there yeah and they walked into an environment that was very very different where everything had meaning and the relative spacing of things had meaning mm. as well so yeah we, we found that to to be very very important very very effective well it's inductive isn't it yes it is so the minute the person comes in the room yeah like you say you you're creating rapport with them you're Absolutely. establishing a relationship and that in and of yes. itself is that therapy starts at that point it, it, it does it, it does if it's uh, psychodynamic yes. and if, of course if it's hypnosis you can actually start at the moment yes. you you make an appointment with someone you can yeah um and the, if you like the deep structure hypnotherapy skills, which means that the process of, of the therapy starts with initial contact mm. uh, and the preparation of someone starts at that point. Yes. And then if you add the effect of the environment to it, then the induction of, of a trans state has already started mm. immediately. Mm. Uh, and all you're really doing is making fine adjustments to it. But an advantage of that is that you're not hurried. And not hurrying is very, very important when you're dealing with the unconscious. You know, you, you mustn't get ahead of yourself. You know, um, it has its own pace and it's polite, really, to be gentle with it rather than to try and ambush it. So for hypnotherapy, definitely. Um, but when you access somebody, you do it immediately that they first contact you. And if that's over the phone, obviously mm -hmm. by email, it's not so, so easy to do. Mm -hmm. But if someone were to ring you up, you can start the induction process at that time. And then the environment yes. that they come into uh, further changes the state in them because it's so unexpected. Yes. Uh, and because we had high tech equipment in there as well, and we had very old stuff there, it's not easy to pin down what's going on in a, in a, in a room like that. Very, very unexpected things. Uh, and there would be these statues and figurines of pagan mm. gods, you know, and pre-Christian gods. And then there'll be a painting of a Christian church. And then there'll be other things like a sand tray. And of course we have the catnograph and mm. the, the, the fountain and various other things. There. So it, it's difficult for a person to assess that environment and log on to it in such a way that allows them to dismiss it. It's interesting. Uh, and it stimulates the mind in the way that a child is stimulated in a way by, by a play area, would yes, you say? Yes, I know? would. I, I would because um, there's an element of, you know, what what takes place here. Mm. It, it opens somebody up, doesn't it, to explore? Yes. As opposed to it just being almost, um, like I say, with a counselling setup of being cell-like. Mm. 
Mm. Uh, and there's you and there's the counsellor and there's very little else in the room yeah. and I, yeah. I well I've, I've been on the receiving end of counselling so I've kind of got some sort of first hand understanding of that as well and it's just awful it I, is. Have to, I have to it say is. it was just absolutely awful from yeah. beginning to end I would say of all the people we trained yeah. the, the, the ones who had the highest failure rate were ones who'd been trained in person-centred counselling that's, that's Rogerian counselling uh, they were beyond redemption, probably, because they've been so conditioned by that that, that there was no way that they could become effective clinicians at all. Uh, because they, they shy away, don't they, from any kind of direct yes, uh, they, they do. meeting of yeah. a human being as a real yeah. person. Yeah. You know, no, no skill at all, absolutely none. Whereas, um, to use our room as an example... Uh, and, and what I just said about how you log on to somebody when they enter a place like this, I would refer people back to the existing photographs that you can obtain online and in books of Carl Jung's study, mm -hmm. where he would see patients. And when we went there as well, we could see mm -hmm. just how carefully that was crafted. It, the, the actual room where he, where he saw patients was very much like a confessional. Yes, it was. From, it was um, a small room, wasn't it? Beautiful. And it was darkly painted as was it dark of a dark green paint? it was it was green everything yes. was green the, the yeah. wood was green uh, there was stained glass yeah. in there uh, and it was quite narrow mm. as well um it, it had a the, the sense of a confessional yeah which for, for young's time i think and for his interest in christianity and, and because people of those days would mm. have resonated with that model it fitted really really well and then he had a broader study where he would take people um uh, when they'd moved on a bit you know, and, and then he could he could show them his books and the view over the lake and his mm -hmm. boat house. And it's there where the photographs we published with Franz Jung were taken. But taking our, our cue from that, and, and also from Freud as well, because Freud made sure he illustrated his environment, mm -hmm. his therapeutic environment, very, very carefully. That you use space, you use your speech, you use how you greet people. <coughs> Everything has to be used to gain rapport. Um, rapport is a vital clinical skill and it's so misunderstood um, it's not empathy for example um, and counsellors if any of them are still listening to this <laughs> if they haven't been offended and switched off empathy is something which can be faked you know but rapport you can't fake it it's either there or it's not and rapport is goal directed you have an intention for gaining rapport Whereas the only real intention for empathy is to generate the suggestion that someone is being received and understood. And there are all sorts of problems with that if you uh, rely upon it, aren't there, look, you know? Like with, uh, with respect to identification, which, which can happen. Uh, if you try and feel what another person feels, then suddenly it's not them feeling anymore. It's all about your feelings. Or, worse still, you identify completely with the other person yeah. and you bring them in so much that they pollute you and yes. they dissolve your ability to be effective other than to smile inanely at someone <laughs> and ask them how they feel. Yeah. <clears throat> but rapport is completely different. Uh, rapport is about logging on to the way a person makes sense or indeed nonsense of their ongoing experience at that time. And then what you need to do is to access that person's recall, their anamnesis, if you like, to, to use the Jungian term, of how they've made sense and nonsense of their life up until that point and, and how their complexes have become active and their frustrations and so forth. So you need to facilitate them to access that. Uh, empathy is not sufficient to do that because empathy can forestall you getting deep into someone because it's a very superficial thing, isn't it, really? And it regards... On, or in, in regards to how it can stimulate oxytocin and everybody feels good, but nothing is actually happening. Mm. Whereas rapport is a state where on the outside you're doing one thing, so to speak, <clears throat> and on the inside you're doing another. And what you're doing on the inside is processing massively with, in, in terms of bandwidth, and you're looking back at what's likely to have happened for this person, you're looking forward, and you're analysing the present. And in the present... You analyze your own reactions consciously, you open yourself up to your own unconscious, and you're monitoring the other person, not only for their conscious reactions, but for outward, outward signs of their unconscious activity, 
but you also, if you have real rapport, gain a perception of what's happening with the unconscious. And you pick this up through your body, I would say, because this is where you first become aware of it. It's a somatic expression, isn't it, love? You know, which, which occurs unconsciously and then appears consciously through a process of transformation. And this is when you get the four persons present in the room and there are only two of you, as Jung would say. Yes. You know, you have yourself, you have the person you're working with and two unconsciouses, and then they're in synchrony, in harmony, in rapport, or they're not. Yes. And that's the alchemy that begins immediately. And this, if you like, is why I've suggested to people that they look at Collective Work 16. Um, because that's where you will see, albeit in al allegorical form, pretty much everything you need to know to work in depth. But it has to be decoded. It's not just a case of what's written on the page. Just as the, the images in the Rosarium don't actually tell you what's going on, they just give you an indication of the process but the process is experiential. Um, if, if you go into something like ION, for example, you might go there just for the sake of it and for whatever, but it's not going to help you work on yourself in any real sense at all. It will not give you the practical skills to self-analyze. It will not give you the practical skills to analyze others. And it will not give you the practical skills to understand the relationship between people in a therapeutic encounter. That's why I say go to Collective Work 16. Remember, Jung was a psychotherapist. He was not a philosopher. No, he was a therapist first and foremost. Everything he did should be seen through that lens. So yeah, what do you feel, love, over the way that we gain rapport and we use the environments? Um, I was thinking about hypnotherapy, mm. particularly. Um, we talked about this yesterday, actually, mm. uh, uh, in terms of how much more difficult it is to do well than it is oh, yeah. to do psychotherapy yes, well because to some extent you can lose yourself in the, the almost conversational style that the psychotherapy allows you mm. but with hypnotherapy everything's so finely tuned mm. and I, I think it honed your observation oh, gotcha. skills even yeah. more than psychotherapy oh, definitely does. definitely yeah Definitely. Everything's about that. Yeah. Everything. Because it is so practical. And, and again, we've said on, on a previous podcast that you have to get the right training for it. But everything is based on your capacity to observe and understand what you're seeing. Um, and as Milton Erickson said to the young analyst, Ernest Rossi, look at the patients. Don't yes. look at me. Mm. Because Erickson was looking at the patients. Mm. So that, that's what you, you, know, you have to be able to do. And you don't have to look directly at them. You can look indirectly. Yes. It's sometimes better to do that, actually. It is. Yeah. Yeah. And here's a practical experiment you might like to try that would help. Dare I say it, and this is perhaps a little bit of a professional secret and uh, potentially inappropriate, but you can, you can take somebody's pulse remotely mm. if you know how to look at them, particularly if, say, in this <coughs> example, if they, they have their leg crossed. And if you cross your leg and you just relax after a while your leg will start to move yeah it's called a cardiogenic spike right it's called it's caused by the pulse pressure going through your body so you don't even have to look at someone directly if you can just see the foot you can begin to calibrate then their heartbeat the heart rate mm. and then you can begin to calibrate what you're saying according to the beat and the rhythm of the heart you will begin to get rapport immediately if you do that outside of their conscious awareness but their unconscious knows what you're doing you know? and this is a hypnotherapy skill and it's a very very important one and there are many many others mm. language patterning how you pace what you say how long the pauses are whether you give sufficient room for the other person to speak um, all of this is really really important and we we both feel this don't we paul that that, that hypnotherapy in the classical sense, mm. is absolutely the foundation for all of psychotherapy. I would go so far as to say that psychotherapy is a sub-modality of hypnotherapy mm. for historical reasons, Definitely. for yeah. sure, mm. because both psychoanalysis and analytical psychology and then even behaviour therapy and everything, including cognitive therapy that's flowed on from that, all have their basis in hypnotherapy. Joseph Wolpe, the founder of uh, behaviour uh, therapy, or one of the founders of it, 
created the mm. technique of systematic desensitization initially as a hypnotherapy technique. Um, now, what they do wrong, frankly, the behaviorists and the cognitivists, is that they employ suggestion without a trance and therefore make it relatively ineffective immediately. Um, there are reasons for that. You have to be good at hypnotherapy to make it work. Bad hypnotherapists are just ineffective and potentially dangerous. So it generates a lot of anxiety in therapists to take on the responsibility that hypnotherapy can give you. But all really effective psychodynamic skills are rooted in it. And if you blend hypnotherapy skills, even if you don't induce a formal trance, into psychodynamic therapy, into depth psychology as an applied clinical method, you will find that you increase your effectiveness dramatically, absolutely dramatically. So those, those skills that we, we feel are absolutely fundamental and anybody who trains in depth psychology should be trained in hypnotherapy. It, for us, it's a sine qua known, it's a not without, it, it, it should be there. Well, it's important in, in uh, frontline healthcare because of the speed at which you're expected yeah. to work, really. Yes. You don't have the luxury no. of months and years with someone no. um, and you, you're expected to get results. Mm. And I think so long as, like you say, Steve, you can back it up yeah. with you, your psychodynamic uh, knowledge yeah. and, and your knowledge of medicine and so on. And you yeah. can literally mm. um, use it as a, con the hypnotherapy as a container to, to pour everything into and then use it to deliver what you know then that's it's a very profound way of working and, and a very quick and effective way yes. of working if you do it properly absolutely you, you can deal with, with a lot of problems very very quickly and it's the bridge between psyche and soma par excellence nothing nothing touches it at all and also the way that the better ones deal with the unconscious is so indirect to consciousness and this is a really important thing you can work with the unconscious indirectly. That, that's what they say, and truly, it's what they do. Whereas if you take a conventional psychodynamic approach, everything is structured. And the problem with that is that you, you create clutter. You create things to clutter your own mind, consciously, and you create things that the patient can clutter their mind with as well, consciously. That means the unconscious has to work quite hard to get past all that noise. It's a signal to noise issue. Whereas the best hypnotherapy accesses the unconscious, as I've just said, indirectly. It doesn't ask for the kind of things that would get in the way. The kind of things which, for people who follow young and perhaps get a little bit misguided, if I can be so bold as to say, uh, get misguided by which are the over fantasies and symbols and the like. Good hypnotherapists know how to use metaphor mm. indirectly. Because the unconscious likes metaphor, it likes narrative. Yes, it likes symbols, but it likes to produce its own. It doesn't like to be told what it's going to experience. In that sense, it's polite to ask it or to, or to give it room, to give it space to produce what it wants to produce. And it doesn't necessarily want to access consciousness directly. For example, it is quite possible to ask the unconscious mind, for its help and to do the work outside of ego consciousness so that the patient doesn't even have to know what is going on uh, and then you'll find that that person starts to improve and get well and they don't even know why it's happened but what they've experienced which is advantageous over a lot of uh, direct probing methods superficial ones if you like is that they don't need to feel any more anxiety about what's going on. If they come in an anxious state, what the hell is the point of making them feel worse? But if you can reassure them that the unconscious mind can solve the problem for them without them having to feel anxious or to feel depressed or any of these not so nice aspects of suffering and that all they have to do is to open the door and respect the psyche and the psyche will respect them back and things will work well. You can get a result very, very quickly. Mm. Now, of course, the downside of that is that there's no apparent insight. Now, well, that's, that's arguable, actually, because what you will find is that people's insight starts to occur to them at the pace that the unconscious wants to let them receive that information without you pushing and probing and making things difficult for them. So we would probably use 
a psychodynamic approach to hypnosis in those cases where we were time limited and where it was unsafe within the framework of it being time limited to push and probe somebody into a state where they might get Mm. such a significant release of emotion that they may compromise themselves physiologically yes. and we, we've discussed this in the past we have yeah the dangers of abreaction the dangers of abreaction yeah yeah uh, which uh, used to be called the cathartic method mm. it's um, become the goal of counseling yeah like if has, you can get yeah. someone to cry a bit well bingo success your job done yeah and it's just it's, you know yeah. the, you're right they, they take yeah. that they turn that as a metric for they success do. if they can upset someone they do because obviously when someone's had a good cry as opposed to a bad one, then they feel better for a while. And this is a psychoneuroendocrine phenomenon. Mm. But when, when the nice hormones wear off, they'll want to cry again, and perhaps not so nicely. And also, if you do release emotion like that at the wrong point in, in somebody's treatment, then you'll find that some other ideas and associations mm. that are around consciousness will start to utilize that and mm. attach the emotions to them because it is an economical thing, the psyche. It works through energy and information and how you apportion and displace that between different active structures. So if you have a malignant conscious, which is, uh, sorry, complex, which is um, hovering on the edge of consciousness, waiting its opportunity like a predator, mm -hmm. and then a well-meaning therapist accesses some emotion and raises that up to the level of consciousness, it'll jump on it. Yeah. In other words, I'll have a bit of that, thank you. Mm -hmm. I'll see you later and see you later with something not very nice. And what's happened then is you've had an association between things that were not previously associated. Yes. So you have to be careful. Now, where you're working with people whose inclination is more towards personal development and they're physiologically sound, then you don't need to use such a safe, I'll call it safe, psychodynamically safe, method as hypnosis but you might choose to at a particular point because as a form of imagery it's uh, it's unparalleled nothing goes near it at all nothing absolutely nothing mm -hmm. and i'm almost disappointed to admit that but it is the truth nevertheless um and it's something that you can only be really certain of if you've experienced it and compared and contrasted it in terms of outcome yeah. with other forms of of, uh, of uh, therapy so yeah, um, it, it, hypnosis is a vital tool for the psychodynamic therapist. It, it gives you so much more to be able to do. It's economical in terms of your own development too, because you can access yourself very quickly and you can set up a signaling system, which uh, Jung himself was aware of because he used to utilize it himself uh, in his investigation of the occult, for example. Um, but you don't have to do it within that framework. You can do it in a naturalistic way. So the, the signaling system you're talking about is the, for example, raising of the finger? The, the idiomosa, yes. yes, idiomosa. And um, you, you see this with table tilting, planchettes, Ouija boards. Um, you, you get it in hysteria too. H hysteria is an exaggerated form of idiomosa um, dissociation. Uh, you also get it in Chevreau's pendulum. And um, not everyone will agree with me here, so I'll, I'll qualify it, but I'm going to say it and then add a caveat. All uh, pendulum phenomenon fundamentally are Chevreau's pendulum, they're idiomotor responses. Um, so people who use crystals and dowsing and the like yeah. are also accessing idiomotor phenomenon. Okay, that's, that's my position on it. Uh, now I'll add the caveat. From within the framework that other people operate, they will have their own explanation that fits well to them and it's functional. And in that sense, it has a reality and it has a validity. Um, and I think it's very wise to understand other modalities of expression for using things like that. So you don't ride roughshod over it with your own ideas, but you do have to have a position on things. Uh, and my position certainly, having experienced a lot of, of different phenomenon with this is that they are all idiomotor phenomenon uh, and I would even reduce the occult down to that as you normally see it. Now a further caveat this does not mean to say that the phenomenon is only the way that it is expressed. In other words an idiomotor phenomenon is that but what is being transmitted through it that's a completely different thing. So 
if you're working with the so-called occult, say in a Ouija board, you can say that the physical movement of the glass is a summation and adding up in real time of uh, cumulative idiomotor effects. Idio means mind, motor just means movement. However, what's manifesting through that medium, so to speak, and I don't mean psychic medium as such, I just mean the physical medium, will be the unconscious of the persons concerned added up collectively. But as well as an adding up, it's also an adding down. Because when you get a group of people together, right, the unconscious tends to flatten out and take out an average position. Uh, and therefore it doesn't reflect the higher, if you like, levels of the unconscious. It starts to become more infantile uh, and then it starts to get more primitive. And it's in the infantile and primitive layers that you get superstition acting. When superstition, as we would understand that externally starts to act, it's at that point that you'll start to uh, get people uh, falling over and fainting and, and screaming and crashing out and thinking the devil's there. Uh, because that's the level and layer of the unconscious that you've accessed and that's what's coming through the idiomotor phenomenon. All of that said, you can calibrate Chevreau's pendulum as very quickly if you do the right things and you have to know what you're doing with it to make it effective. You can access the unconscious and get its cooperation to agree with you and with the person you're trying to help to find a solution for them very, very quickly without them even having to, as I say, to be concerned about it consciously. You, you can even measure the transference relationship if you use Chavreau's pendulum effectively. In other words, you can manage it right from the beginning by setting up basically a transference structure within which it will progress in a healthy and positive way. I don't know if you think that's something that, that's worth discussing or, or not, but it, it is something that we, that we, should, we should express at some point. How, how do you feel on that, James? Yeah, it's also, um, I mean, you mean this bad boy, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Good. this, uh, I've, I've been, I do use it occasionally as a party trick and it's, it's, it's um, I've used it a little bit in, I'd say personal development stuff too to ask the unconscious what, what's, what's going on. But there was a weird one I did recently with this, actually. Um, and it seems to answer in riddles, at least for myself. So I, I'll ask it a question. So for people who aren't familiar, you'd, you'd take the thing and you'd make it straight down. And then you can ask it questions and it moves, basically. It, it can mm. move in any particular direction. You say like, yes and no. But I've asked it questions before direct questions and it's given me like the wrong answer but if i clarify it slightly it will then give me the right answer as if it's like deliberately trying to trick me or deliberately trying to get a little riddle out i don't i don't know i, I wouldn't have done it enough to have like a systematic you know, scientific study well, I, I, on it. i'll offer you an explanation on that see when, when you work with someone uh, in the way that, that we're suggesting yeah. this is this is what what we used to do you have to take your time you have to take your time in order to, to absolutely calibrate and, and, and it, the calibration is everything. If um, you play around with it like it's a party trick, which is why I never do, to be honest, um, you're, you're going to create a, a situation where it will want to trick you to teach you a lesson. And by it, I don't mean anything uh, occult. I mean, the psyche itself will start to have fun with you. Uh, and, and clinically, that's that's not good from the start. So there is a there is a protocol to go through with it, and it, it's quite structured. Um, when you use it clinically with, with a third party, that does not trivialise it, uh, and will pretty much get the right kind of answer. The, the main thing is you have to accept, and you have to be completely willing to accept whatever it is that it decides to say. But you can test out, as I say, the developing transference, which is the relationship, the therapeutic relationship with your patient there and then um, by asking the patient's unconscious mind if it's OK for you as a therapist to help them. You know, in other words, will will you, the unconscious mind of whoever, allow me to help them? And if it's no, you have to accept that. Yes. And then you have to, and if that were to happen, you have to say, is there someone else or in some other method? Or it's like 20 questions. If you're patient, you'll get there. And as you go along, 
the signals will, will, will start at first, the, the clear, then they get vague and ambiguous, and then they get very, very clear, very clear. And, and this is a natural waveform that occurs. And what you're doing is you're going down through progressive stages of access and reaction to you. Because the person, the client, who, the patient who's holding the, the watch, you have to hold it in the right way. You need to let your wrist go completely limp and be supported. And you need to use a pincer grip. All of this will, will reduce extraneous uh, pressures. So you're definitely going to pick up an, an idiomotor phenomenon rather than perhaps a little bit of conscious fluff or, or residual tension or vibration or even cardiogenic spikes through your, through your arm. It's not just through the leg you get them, they, they pulse through the whole body. So you, you can ask uh, about outcomes, um, but, you, but you must always say thank you to the unconscious. You must mean it when you say it. Um, and then you, you get a very, usually you get a very, a very, very positive response, which the person can then experience because they're holding the watch, you're not. And they feel sometimes a very sharp jolt. It actually jumps, mm. you know, if, if they're in the right frame of dissociated mind. And the movement can be dramatic. And the other thing that we do, that we do to pressure test it, we demonstrate about lying and how it can catch you, you out lying. Uh, and what I would do is that I would put my, rest my arm on, on, the, on the arm of the chair. I would, sorry if this is off camera, let's get this right. Hold it in the right way. And I would say something, so for example, say this person was called John. I would say, it is true that John is sitting over there in that chair. You know, I would actually pace it slower than that, much slower. Make sure that what you say is clear. Modulate the tone of your voice too. And then this allows the unconscious to take in the lowering of your tone of voice and gives it a chance to react. And if it is true, then the watch will, set, will give an indication that at that moment, yes. And so you see de very definitely what it is. And then you say, it's absolutely true that John isn't in the room. I'm here on my own. It's absolutely true. And you do it with as much fake honesty as you can. And what you'll find is the watch, if it's still moving in, in the, the yes direction, say it's that way, will start to go like this. And then it'll go that way. And it'll say, no, you're not. It's not true. And then what you're demonstrating is that the, the unconscious is interested in truth. You then hand the watch to the patient. The patient calibrates it. And then you ask the unconscious of the patient for a response to a question. And it might be, does the unconscious mind agree to allow me to help them? And then you, you, you phrase some other words and then you'll get your response and it might be yes. And you say, thank you. Yeah, you always thank the unconscious. You've got to do that. You know, any sign of disrespect to it, zero cooperation, or you get like a merry dance. Not good. So once, uh, once that's done and you get the uh, idiomosa signal that it's okay for you to help them, it's okay for this person to solve the problem, it's all right for them to get well, you've built up a fantastic amount of rapport with their unconscious mind very, very quickly. Thereafter, all you need to do is to maintain that initial state of rapport and trust. You have to maintain trust once you've got it and you have to work to get it. Now, when you have that, that, that cooperation, as I say, you can then move on. You can use pretty much any technique, can't you? You can use dream analysis, sand tray, creative therapy, word associations, capnography, anything you like, typology. You know, you can administer your type tests at that point um, and get pretty much everything you need to get a result. So that's, that's practical, real world, very simple way of accessing the unconscious mind quickly and getting its cooperation. It may, for example, say something, it does happen, doesn't it? Mm. Where, where they'll say, for example, uh, or the unconscious will indicate, no, it's not all right for this person to solve this problem. Mm. You still thank it. And then you reframe your question and say, is there a time when it will be all right? And it might say, yes. And again, like 20 questions, you've got to work at it. Don't rush, slowly, paced, relaxed and it will tell you and it might be in two or three weeks time it'll be okay and then you've got your answer you would never have got that answer had you just gone in there and either tried to be nice to them how does it feel to be so depressed 
the unconscious will be going like this at you. <laughs> That's how it feels to be depressed, you idiot. Yeah. And in effect, it will then separate itself from you and also from the, uh, mm. from the patients still further. So all you're doing is increasing mm. the neurotic divide. What you should do with rapport is to close that as much as possible and bring through the healthy part of the psyche that wants this person to be well. And it might well be, is there something I need to know that I don't know? This is you as a therapist. And this would be after, say, you've got the anamnesis from them, the case history. Is, is there something else that I need to know that perhaps I haven't been told because it's not the right time? And then you might get a yes on that. And then, okay, mm -hmm. there's more I need to know. You could, you could pursue that further by, gently, uh, by saying, D does the person themselves know what this is? yes or no it might be no is it safe for them to know now what this is and it might be oh no when will it be safe they'll give you a time or is there something i need to do before this person will be ready to receive from you the unconscious the information that they need to know to get well safely hugely important questions why on earth would you go in and say to somebody, you must stop your negative automatic thoughts, go and have some homework? Yeah, yeah? this cognitivism shit. Now, I'm, I'm afraid, mm -hmm. sorry for using the word, but it is. It's utter and complete garbage. It's aggressive, it's directive, um, it will immediately engender resistance. And if you're dealing with a thinking type, to use Jung's typology, you're going to find as a cognitive therapist that these people will outthink you oh, yeah. and you're going to have no chance. And if you deal with a feeling type, they won't listen to you because it sounds too much like it's thinking. Even if they don't understand what thinking and feeling are in Jungian terms, they will know, dare I say it, instinctively mm -hmm. that the style that's being used on them is not commensurate with how they process their ongoing experience. It will be offensive to them, won't it? It will. Yeah. Mm. Um, sorry, love. Yeah. No, no. I, I, I was thinking what you were saying actually earlier um, when you were, I think, suggesting that you talked about hypnotherapy. Yeah. Um, and about insight. Mm. Um, not everybody seeks or is seeking insight into no. themselves who comes no. in to work with you clinically. No. And in in some ways, hypnotherapy is is very useful in that regard mm. uh, because you can affect a, a cure or a change without necessarily having to delve in that way or yeah. to make people talk about the past all the time yeah. um it, it can be very effective for people who aren't seeking that yeah. and, and they they do exist they do absolutely most people don't want any of this at all yeah they just want to be well they just want to stop the suffering you know that that, that thing that i seem to be get or we've seen to be getting yeah. criticized for a mm. lot which is saying that, no why suffer mm. uh, and as a as I've said before, you wouldn't go to a doctor in complete health and say, doctor, I don't have a disease. I feel so guilty that I'm not suffering. Please give yes. me something really unpleasant. And then I can feel that like my life means something because yes. I'm suffering. Yeah. Like these guys on the internet are saying that suffering is good for you mm. and, it's, and that it's inevitable. Well, yes, of course it's inevitable. Why do you want to make it worse? Mm. And if you're a therapist, you should be dedicated to ending suffering wherever you can. Because if you're not, then there's a part of your shadow that you've not integrated that will probably want to get off on other people's suffering, mm. want to make it worse, mm. want to enjoy it, want to be a voyeur, all these things which yeah. proper psychodynamic training should exorcise out from you. Mm. But you have to do that work. You, you know, you, most people don't come ready made able to gain rapport with people. They don't come ready made with an understanding of their shadow because they don't even know what it is. They don't know what the, what the concept of it is. Most people only live in their conscious mind.